This week on the Back Table Podcast. When, when I'm uh, trying to make that judgment, looks like they've got obstructive dysfunction. How bad is it? I will frequently have them sit up because it's much harder to pop your ear when you're supine. I'll sit them up, have them try to do it. And I, I try to coach all of them, even the kids, and how to do a modified Valsalva. So, so we're, we're not thrilled with a standard Valsalva, which is what most patients will do, hold their nose and blow as hard as they can, blowing their, their brains out. I, I've literally had a couple of patients who have uh, developed permanent sensory neural uh, hearing loss injury or vertigo or both from doing that excessively uh, firmly. So we teach a modified Valsalva, which is what the scuba divers do. That's the nose and mouth closed, only gently blowing, just generate a little bit of positive pressure, and then a simultaneous swallow. But as you said, that's tricky to blow and swallow at the same time, and many of the patients just simply cannot do it. So we, we try to teach them to do it, but if they tell me, yeah, that worked, I, I popped my ear, that was easy. I'm already thinking this is not a severe obstructive dysfunction. And then I'll lay them back down under the microscope and see what change it made. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast. We are a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. Quick word from our sponsor, Stryker. Stryker's ENT solutions offer the control you need, the flexibility you want, and enable you to deliver the experience your patients deserve. With Stryker, you gain access to the most complete suite of solutions to help make your vision of patient care a reality. From technology to training, from reimbursement tools to patient education, Stryker is there to help. Together with their customers, they are driven to make healthcare better. Learn more at ent.stryker.com. My name is Ashley Agan, and I'm a general ENT in Dallas, Texas at UT Southwestern. My co-host, Gopi Shaw, is on call this weekend, so she's joining us in spirit. We are sending her lots of love and positive vibes. Dr. Dennis Poe is our guest today. He is a professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School. He specializes in neurotology and skull-based surgery and has worked to develop minimally invasive endoscopic surgical techniques in this field as well as new procedures for eustachian tube disorders. In 2011, he completed a PhD at the University of Tampere, Finland, in pathophysiology and surgical treatment of the eustachian tube and did postdoctoral work with the Nano Ear European Union Consortium on Nanotechnology for Targeted Delivery of Inner Ear and Middle Ear Therapy. Welcome to the show, Dr. Pope. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ashley, and thank you for all of you uh, for tuning in. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here, so thank you for this. Thank you. So we like to kick off the show just by asking you to tell us about you and your practice. You know, how does a neurotologist find himself spending so much time in the back of the nose looking at the eustachian tube? How, you know, how did you become the, the guy to go to about eustachian tube disorders? Oh, goodness. It's been a long road. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an otologist, neurotologist, and uh, so my practice really was restricted to those fields. But as you know, the eustachian tube is the root of many otologic evils, otitis media. And uh, so I've increasingly uh, had to turn back to studying that and uh, developing, getting, getting some training again and going back into the nasal cavity, uh, nasal endoscopy, and ultimately working on developing eustachian tube types of procedures. I started out uh, in residency questioning why we were reconstructing so many ears and not preventing the problems. So it, it was a uh, frustrating situation. Uh, the eustachian tube was thought of as a black box, and yet we knew that it was the root of many problems downstream in, the, uh, in otitis media and all of the complications. So uh, my original background is in engineering, and there's nothing like an unsolved problem to stimulate uh, an engineer <laughs> to want to try and figure this out. That, that makes sense. So, so just um, setting the stage. So when we, when we talk about eustachian tube disorders, or when we say eustachian tube dysfunction, is that kind of like, you know, a broad term, meaning, you know, anything wrong with the eustachian tube? Like, how do you um, separate it in your mind? Because I feel like there's, you know, as most of us know, you can have problems with an obstructed eustachian tube or problems with a eustachian tube that's maybe a little too open and maybe a lot of 
in between? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a, uh, we, we've in the past thought of eustachian tube dysfunction as being principally an obstructive problem. And we've traditionally thought that patchless eustachian tube was a rare problem. So it turns out patchless is far more common than we ever imagined. It's, it's actually very common. And there's a spectrum of dysfunction. So I, I use the term eustachian tube dysfunction now to mean anything on this spectrum from complete obstruction to just having trouble on an airplane, diving, uh, and all the way up to getting stuck open patchless. So I, I lump all of those together as, together as eustachian tube disorders or eustachian tube dysfunction, and we separate them as a spectrum between obstructive and patchless. Yeah, I think, you know, I went to your course, you guys do a course um, up at Harvard in the spring. And I think I went back in, it might've been 2018 or something. And after that started looking, you know, more at the eustachian tube and looking for more patchless. And I agree, like once you start looking for it, I felt like, oh, <laughs> there's a lot of, maybe there's a lot of patchless patients that I just never caught. <laughs> Well, it's true. And, and they fool us the way they describe their problem. They always say, my ear is blocked. It's full. There's pressure. Uh, and then I'll talk about how they can't hear. But actually, what they mean is their voice and their breathing is drowning out outside sounds. So they really set us up to miss it. And that's why we have to have a high index of suspicion when we see these people. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk a little bit about the physiology? Like what is happening? Because like, I feel like one symptom that all eustachian tube patients tend to kind of have in common is the pressure ear, you know, clogged, clogged ear stuffiness, ear pressure sensation. And is that, you know, in the, I feel like in the patients that have like a dilatory dysfunction where there, it really is obstructed. And if we see negative pressure, if we see a type C tympanogram, it makes sense like, oh, there's negative pressure, you know, pulling the eardrum in and that's giving, that's causing pressure. But you know, it doesn't, how do you explain a patchless patient feeling that, or do we know? Yeah, I, I mean, they, they uh, if you ever want to simulate a patchless eustachian tube, you take a stethoscope and hold the diaphragm up to your mouth, right in front of your mouth, and you talk and breathe into it. It's extraordinarily loud, and this is exactly what they hear. I can tell you that because if I uh, exercise vigorously enough, I can get the symptoms. It's really annoying. So that's a, that's a remarkable simulation. And you will, you will experience this uh, sort of, you know, head in a barrel fullness that they talk about. And actually, if it's really bad, uh, your, your breathing is push, pushing air back and forth in the ear and giving them a true pressure, variable pressure sensation, which they won't describe unless you specifically ask about it. So eustachian tube fullness really is a pressure phenomenon, or it can be just a, an auditory sense, they'll describe that. Uh, we see people with sensory neural hearing loss and they tell us their ears are full, and blocked. If you could only take that cotton out of their ear, they'd be hearing better. So it's a, this oral fullness is a very wide description that patients will use and it's up to us to sort that out. Yeah, that's a good point. I, yeah, the, those um, like a sudden sensory not sudden sensory loss or a or a Meniere's patient will have that fullness too. So that's that's a good point. It, it maybe it's some of it's the sensation that's related to having that drop in your hearing. Right. So it's up to us to sort out what's the fullness. Is it truly a pressure issue, or is it something really different? Uh, sensory neural loss. Uh, Meniere's can have pressure because of the hearing loss or because of inner ear pressure. Semicircular canal dehiscent patients describe fullness, conductive hearing losses as well. And uh, uh, temporal mandibular disorders, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's such a common thing. And so in, in addition to, so if we're kind of, you know, just um, thinking about how these patients are presenting to your clinic, they maybe they've got the ear fullness or, you know, the clog stuffiness. What other types of symptoms will they usually report to you? Well, are you talking about uh, eustachian tube patients in general or are you... So, uh, obstructive or patchless? Yeah, eustachian tube in general, and then we can kind of like maybe separate them into, okay, which ones do you have a higher index of suspicion for patchless versus obstructive? So the patient, their principal complaint is typically ear fullness, oral fullness. And so we try to Im immediately separate that out. What kinds of problems is it causing? And on the obstructive side, 
They may have otitis media issues. They um, may have had actual infections or fluid or just negative pressure. They're barrow challenged, trouble with uh, rapid ambient pressure changes, uh, flights, diving. And uh, they, they uh, may have had a history of tympanic membrane retraction that's being uh, followed. They may have had a history of tympanostomy tubes as a young child. So that's the group that's the most common. Uh, our standard, what's been traditionally called eustachian tube dysfunction, what I now like to call obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. So we immediately try to sort those out by their history. And then in the process, I will always ask nowadays about autophony. Do you, do you ever have a situation where you have a pop or a click in your ear and it's, you're suddenly hearing your voice echoing, your breathings like Darth Vader's in your ear? And you'll be surprised at how many patients with obstructive dysfunction will also tell you, oh yeah, I've had that, uh, you know, I was exercising, it happened. So uh, we re really have to specifically ask about it. And do you feel like the popping and clicking, is that more specific to a patchless phenomenon because they're hearing their eustachian tube open? Is that is that basically what that popping and clicking is? Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, and so when I hear a patient talking about popping and clicking, as a big part of their complaint, it's much more likely to be patchless or possibly temporomandibular disorders and far less likely to be obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. So that's a very common symptom that misleads us when they start talking about the popping and clicking. They are steering us to think about obstructive dysfunction when in fact it's probably patchless or temporomandibular disorder. In fact, popping and clicking is one of the questions on the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire, the seven questions. Just, I, I did not participate in how that was developed, but uh, it was done very systematically. Uh, Ed McCool and Vijay Anand uh, did a great study there. But the focus groups of patients would frequently talk about that as a symptom of eustachian tube disorder. It turns out that the ETDQ7 cannot tell the difference between obstructive, patchless, or anything else that causes oral fullness, like temporomandibular disorder, TMD. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more of a questionnaire to just kind of assess the severity of the symptoms, would you say, to, so you can kind of follow things? It's an excellent tool for outcomes measures, uh, symptoms before and after treatment. Uh, so it's a very useful tool for that, but it's not diagnostic. It's not specific for ETD. And, w and when you're talking to these patients, do you get patients who can sound like they have both? So, you know, you ask them, have you ever had issues with your ears clearing when you fly? And they say, oh, yeah, it's really painful to fly. And then you say, do you ever hear your own voice echoing or do you hear your breath? Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, sometimes I do. What do you make of that? Can people kind of fluctuate from one side of the spectrum to the other? Yes, they can. And they do. And it's much more common than we thought, which makes our diagnostic lives very difficult. The most common etiology that will start out with obstructive dysfunction and then eventually lead to patchless is chronic allergic rhinitis. We know that chronic allergic disease can cause patches of atrophy in the mucosa and submucosa, in the nose and sinuses. So I have the hypothesis that it also occurs within the valve of the eustachian tube, which is an extension of our other sinuses. Uh, and that would certainly correlate with what we see on endoscopic examinations. So, uh, in fact, you can have intense inflammation in the nose and, and uh, adenoid, torus tubarius, orifice of the eustachian tube, but then you look into the lumen and you can see this marked atrophy and the patient can be frankly patchless when they have a runny nose with allergic disease. So if you get this kind of patch of atrophy in the valve, you can become patchless, even though you still have even active allergic rhinitis or, or sinusitis. Now, if in the allergic patient, if they are active with their symptoms and congested, they may be completely blocked and obstructed, even to the point of middle ear fusion. But then if their disease is quiescent or they're over-medicated, dehydrated, uh, they can so they can switch over to patchless, and they can go back and forth, which is very confusing, because the patient's always going to say, "My ears just chronically blocked. It's always blocked." So we have to sort those out. 
Short answer is yes. People can definitely have both, or they can have a long history of obstructive, and then they transition to patchless, which is more common. It's not as common to have patients going back and forth, but we have to look out for it. Yeah. So, so for example, they might have they might have had tubes in the past or something that had that had helped, and then now they're having more of the talking in a barrel type of symptoms where it's more patchless full time, that sort of thing, progression. Well, that's right. And to add to the confusion, sometimes a tube will treat a patchless eustachian tube, particularly if they have uh, more autophony of their breathing than the voice, it's more likely to help. So just simply knowing that a tube helped doesn't help us sort out patchless versus obstructive dysfunction. It's all about the autophony and looking at the tympanic membrane to see if it's moving with their, with their breathing, particularly if you block the opposite nostril, so ipsilateral nasal breathing to look for it. And do you have to have autophony to, to be patchless? Like if, if a patient says, oh, I hear myself swallow, like I'm hearing clicking every time I swallow, is that enough to be maybe patchless when they, but they don't truly have the breath and voice autophony? The hearing of their voice and breathing is almost universal, but not always. Uh, occasionally, patients will have difficulty expressing their symptoms. And when you tease it out, you, you get that. On a rare occasion, I'll even put a stethoscope in the patient's ears and have them talk into the diaphragm and say, is that what it sounds like? And Well, yeah, that's it. But I, I rarely do that. Most of the time, if you really ask about it, they will tell you. Or you can have them put their head down between their knees, you know, not propped up on their elbows, way down, chest on the knees. And if their symptoms go away, you know, that, that's really helpful. To add to the confusion, you got to watch out for semicircular canal dehiscence otocapsule dehiscence minor syndrome, because they can also get better when they put their heads down. So you have to sort that out also. You know, now that's far more rare. Yeah, I didn't realize that they got better with their head down as well. That's tricky. It is tricky. The, the, the key points for semicircular canal dehiscence is uh, they typically have autophony of bone conducted sounds, their voice. That's where they hear their eyes moving, the necks creaking, their hearing their chewing, footsteps hit the ground. They don't have autophony of their breathing. That's a big distinction with patchless. What other questions are you asking as far as on, on the history side of it before we move on to physical exam? You know, I think historically for patchless, we thought about patients who had had like a sudden weight loss, like they had lap band surgery or something and lost 100 pounds and now they have autophony. But I found that that's, I, I have maybe a couple of patients where that's the history, but it's not nearly as common as just someone who's had chronic allergic rhinitis for forever. Yeah, that's wonderful that you're, you're noticing that. That's exactly what we've noticed too and published on that. Uh, allergic rhinitis is the most common comorbidity that we've found with patchless, 50%. Weight loss, rapid large weight loss is, uh, was 35% in our series. Reflux was uh, the next in line. And further down, we have uh, stress, anxiety. When you're stressed, uh, people have, have for a long time noticed that these patchless patients can have a lot of stress and anxiety. And it's always been a chicken versus the egg question. Is the stress causing their patchless or is the patchless making them stressed? So what we've observed is that the um, muscles of mastication, especially the medial pterygoid, can act as a secondary dilator of the eustachian tube. It will literally distract the membranous wall out laterally and can contribute to patchless. So if they're clenching their muscles, they can provoke patchless, which makes them more stressed and you get into that vicious cycle. So that was uh, like number four in our list of comorbidities. So you could have patients that have both patchless and TMD too, like those can overlap. Commonly, very much so. And they feed each other. Yeah, well... So moving on to um, moving on to physical exam, what are you looking for? Take us through what your um, physical exam looks like for patients when you're trying to tease out, you know, is this an obstructive um, pathology? Is this patchless? Is this not even related to the eustachian tube? You know, um, is, it, is it something like TMD or um, superior canal dehiscence or something else? Right. So the first thing to, uh, to, to notice is the condition of the tympanic membrane 
in comparison to their symptoms on that day. So if they've got a retracted tympanic membrane, I'm talk, talking about a non-fixed, you can see that it's, it's uh, retracted in by uh, negative pressure, not an adherent type. That's indicating negative pressure. You can insufflate it. That's indicating negative pressure. Is there a middle ear fusion? So these are all obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, very clear signs. If there's evidence of negative pressure or middle ear fluid, that's, that's obstructive dysfunction. Now, other possible hints would be uh, scarring, tibial sclerosis, uh, fixed retraction pockets. That's indicating that they've, at least in the past, had obstructive dysfunction. It may not be current. So evidence of negative active pressure is, is the most common obstructive dysfunction finding. And then you'll cross-correlate that with, with testing. Now, if the tympanic membrane is normal looking and their complaint is just a, a problem when they're barrow-challenged, I only have trouble when I fly, you can easily have a normal tympanic membrane. So in that case, your physical findings are not, you know, with, with just your otoscope and head and neck exam, until you use an endoscope, you won't have any evidence of the problem with that one. And then if you suspect patchless, they've given you a, a, a history that, uh, oh yeah, uh, this autophony, I, it clicks, it pops, I hear echoing. That's where we look for the ipsilateral nasal breathing movement of the tympanic membrane. So I have them uh, hold their nostril closed on the opposite side, mouth closed, and they're breathing in and out, kind of the rate and depth that you would for uh, uh, a lung examination, if you're listening to the lungs auscultating. So not not uh, super forceful because you, you could open your eustachian tube if you do it too forceful in a normal person. So we're looking for just some relatively deep breathing, relatively rapid, and can you see the tympanic membrane moving? And if you do, that is pathognomonic of patulus. So if they have no history of uh, otitis media barrow challenge, no autophony, no findings on the tympanic membrane. That's when I'm thinking about the other disorders. Number one's going to be temporomandibular disorders. And then you've got all the other stuff, uh, ear, uh, ear related uh, semicircular canal dehiscence, high drops, uh, sensory neural hearing loss, conductive. Even some people will posit migraine, which causes everything, right? <laughs> Blame so that's it on how, migraine. That's how right. <laughs> so that, that's how we sort it out is uh, first the history and then looking for those key findings. Is there evidence of negative pressure? That's obstructive. If they've got autophony and the tympanic membrane moves, that's patchless. Now, if they're not actively patchless in their office, if they're not actively having symptoms, it gets more complicated. Sometimes we will literally have them run around the block or up and down some stairs Work, them, uh, work up this sweat, <laughs> come back, and now they're patchless. We, we will literally do that. Or sometimes I'll just have them do 15 deep knee bends, and that's enough to get it going, and then you can see it. Is it important to have the patient sitting up when you're examining for that? Because um, I, would, I would imagine that potentially if you're using like a microscope and you have them laying down, could that mask the patchless? Because most, because, you know, your kind of gravity is kind of potentially pulling you know, make plumping up the eustachian tube, or do, do you usually see it when patients are laying down under the microscope? Well, right. So, so uh, at first, uh, I, I ask, are you having your symptoms right now? Are you having the autophagy? If they say yes, I'll keep them sitting and I'll look with the otoscope first. Now, if I cannot see it, I may lay them down for the microscope and ask, did it go away? Yes, it went away. Okay, so now I know we're dealing either with patchless or possible semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, if the symptoms don't go away, then I continue with the microscope exam. And if the drum does move visibly, that's pathognomonic for patchless. If the drum does not move, and yet they have their symptoms, now I'm thinking that could be otocapsule dehiscence, semicircular canal dehiscence. The final test is when we go to a tympanometry, which we can get to in a bit, where we do a patchless test. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one other complicating diagnostic problem here. A lot of patchless patients actively sniff strongly to control their symptoms. And we've traditionally called this habitual sniffing. So I no longer think it's habitual sniffing. These are patchless patients controlling their symptoms. Mm 
with strong sniffs to try and get some temporary closure of the, of the eustachian tube, they can sniff so strongly that they will generate negative pressures in their middle ear, even to the point of tympanic membrane retraction and middle ear fluid. So back to that original, here's the patient. I've got the blocked ear, I've got a hearing loss, I've got middle ear fluid, I've had lots of tubes. I look in the ear, it looks retracted, there's middle ear fusion, aha, uh -huh. obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. But the patient is sniffing before your very eyes. Why are you sniffing? Oh, it makes my, it, it unblocks my ears. The patient with negative pressure shouldn't be sniffing because that's going to make it worse. So I call that inappropriate instead of habitual. It, they're sniffing to control their patchless. So that sniffing habit is a, is a giveaway. Aha, uh -huh, this is a patchless patient who's sniffing that strongly. And they can even cause a retraction pocket that progresses to cholesteatoma. They're doing it so often and so severely. Thinking about patients like that, I've had maybe a handful of patients who have had tympanoplasties for cholesteatoma, and they are still, they're symptomatic from the standpoint of either having autophony or feeling like they have, you know, fullness in their ears. So we're thinking maybe patchless. The tricky part with those patients is that a lot of times if they've had a cartilage tympanoplasty, you're not going to see that eardrum move with their breath, you know, which is kind of like one of those physical exam findings that kind of, you know, you like to see it like kind of, aha, it solidifies the diagnosis. So in a patient like that, would you just kind of go on symptoms and kind of the um, nasal endoscopy? I know that's a very specific situation, but I'm just curious if you've seen that at all. Well, sure. Typically, we haven't done a cartilage tympanoplasty over the entire tympanic membrane. Sometimes we do, but the majority don't. And you may be able to tease it out with a, a tympanogram. On a reflex decay mode, uh, the patient does the ipsilateral nasal breathing, and it's more sensitive than what you can see with a microscope. By the way, sometimes I'll, I don't do it often, but sometimes I'll even have the patient sitting, looking with the microscope in some of these difficult to diagnose patients. But the most common thing we do is that patchless test. So a temp tympanometer on the reflex decay mode, so you're not varying the pressure, you're just passively recording it. And if the, as the patient, if they are patchless, you can see these uh, changes in the tympanogram tracing coincident with their breathing. That's pathic mnemonic, and it's more sensitive than what you can see, even with the microscope. Gotcha. Now, if that doesn't work, you know, they've got a full cartilage tympanoplasty. Do the symptoms get better when they put their head down? So if they do, and you do the endoscopy and you see what looks like it could be a patchless defect, that, that may be the real thing. Yeah. Do you, um, do you ever have patients, you know, while looking at their eardrum, do you have them, you know, maybe try to hold their nose and do a modified Valsalva to see it, how well they can lateralize the tympanic membrane or, um, you know, where does pneumatic otoscopy come into play? Any of those types of exam maneuvers, are they helpful? Very helpful. We do a lot of pneumatic otoscopy under the microscope. And it's extremely helpful in determining, is it negative pressure? It gives you a qualitative idea how much. If, there, if the tympanic membrane is retracted, partially atelectatic, uh, is it adherent or does it lateralize off? That gives us an idea of, are we thinking we're going to have to do a cartilage tympanoplasty or do they need a tympanostomy tube or some other intervention? Will it reverse the retraction pocket if you can lateralize it off? So, so yeah, absolutely, I, I really do a lot of pneumatic otoscopy. And then as far as having the patient's Valsalva or modified Valsalva, I find that some patients know exactly what I'm talking about and some patients have no clue. They're like, what do you, what do you mean? Like clear my ears, pop my ears, hold my, you know, they're, they're very confused by it. So, but I, the ones that are able to do it really easily, I feel like it gives me a sense of like, okay, you know, when I'm trying to kind of figure out how obstructed they are, if they can you know, lateralize the, the eardrum and push air across the eustachian tube pretty well, I'm, you know, thinking less likely uh, or, or kind of, I guess I'm judging the extent of how severe their their dilatory dysfunction might be. Because some of them might say, you know, oh, it, I can do it, but it's painful. Whereas, so, you know, maybe you think they have some mild dilatory dysfunction, but I, I think it's, it gives me information. Um, but then in the ones who can't do it, it I'm not sure if they can't do it because it's blocked or if they can't do it because I'm not explaining well how to do it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, you're absolutely right. Yes. When, when I'm uh, 
trying to make that judgment, looks like they've got obstructive dysfunction, how bad is it? I will frequently have them sit up because it's much harder to pop your ear when you're supine. I'll sit them up, have them try to do it. And I, I try to coach all of them, even the kids, and how to do a modified Valsalva. So, so we're, we're not thrilled with a standard Valsalva, which is what most patients will do, hold their nose and blow as hard as they can, blowing their, their brains out. I, I've literally had a couple of patients who have uh, developed permanent sensory neural uh, hearing loss injury or vertigo or both from doing that excessively uh, firmly. So we teach a modified Valsalva, which is what the scuba divers do. That's the nose and mouth closed only gently blowing, just generate a little bit of positive pressure and then a simultaneous swallow. But as you said, that's tricky to blow and swallow at the same time. And many of the patients just simply cannot do it. So we, we try to teach them to do it. Frequently, if there's a, somebody else with the patient, I'll have them do it too. And you know, if they get it, I tell them here, there's your coach, they can try to help you practice this. But if they tell me, yeah, that worked, I, I popped my ear, that was easy. I'm already thinking this is not a severe obstructive dysfunction. And then I'll lay them back down under the microscope and see what change it made. Yeah, I think that's that's helpful. De- definitely being able to correlate like, okay, does that help? Does you, you know, are your symptoms different now that you did that? Like I think, you know, sometimes that's helpful for patients to be able to give you that feedback. So moving to the nose. So we've we've looked we've been looking been looking at the eardrum, kind of watching how that's moving and seeing what's going on on that side of it. Now, looking at the eustachian tube in the back of the nose, how, how does that um, proceed for you? What things are you looking for on that exam? So I typically use a uh, fiber optic, just a standard fiber optic for, for my exam. I, I look at the nose, sinuses, larynx. I'm looking for all the different causes for inflammatory disease, which is the, by far the most common reason to have eustachian tube dysfunction of any sort. Uh, it's inflammatory disease in the cartilaginous portion most of the time. So I'm looking for other evidence, allergic disease, rhinosinusitis, reflux, et cetera. And then that's where I, I'll then turn the scope and look at the eustachian tubes. And I, I like the fiber optic because I can do all of this with one endoscopic exam. Plus I can angle the scope uh, by turning it 90 degrees sideways and flexing it back and forth across the, the uh uh, back of the, the nasopharynx, I can align the scope with the lumen of the eustachian tube and get a longitude, longitudinal view, the same way you would look down the larynx and try to see into the subglottis. So that's really important. Uh, most people have been trained to see the torus, tubarius, and we've always thought that that's indicating what's going on inside the eustachian tube. There's actually been papers showing that does not correlate with eustachian tube function. Uh, there, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, lymphoid tissue in the torus that doesn't necessarily penetrate down into the lumen. So we have to train ourselves to actually look into the lumen. And I, I talk about looking at the two walls, the membranous wall, that's the anterolateral side where the uh, tensor muscle is, and the cartilaginous wall, that's the extension of the torus tubarius. So you want to see those two walls where they meet. That's the valve that has to open and close. And you want to see, is there a pathology in that valve? Is it inflamed? So it's not about the torus. It's what's in the valve. How well does it open? And then how well does it close? And if you see a gap that never closes, that could be a patulous defect. Now we can only see up about two-thirds of a cartilaginous eustachian tube with an endoscope. We really cannot see the uh, upper part adequately. Uh, And so you cannot make a final diagnosis of patulus just from the endoscopic. But what you can say is, do you see a defect that could be patulus or not? And I feel like this year, when I was listening to you speak at the academy meeting, that you had a like a scale or a mnemonic or like a list of like things that you're looking for on endoscopy. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I I have a I call it a MILO assessment. So that's the, the mucosa. Sorry, is there a lot of mucus? Uh, is there erythema, edema, lymphoid hyperplasia? And then finally, what's the quality of the opening? So that's the you know, excess mucus, edema, erythema, lymphoid hyperplasia, adenoid-like tissue penetrating into the lumen uh, or robust around the orifice. 
and then that opening. So that those are the bullet points that I'm specifically looking for on the uh, endoscopy exam. And then are you grading them on like a like with a number scale or like a mild, moderate, severe? Or how do you use that in your treatment alg algorithm? So that's exactly what we do. Yeah, there is now uh, a validated scale that one of my fellows put together, Kivikas, and it is uh, normal, mild, moderate, severe, one through four. Mild is just some mild edema. The vessels are a little un indistinct, but there's no compromise of the opening. Moderate, there's inflammatory disease. The, the, uh, there is compromise of the opening. And then severe, it never opens. So it's a, it's a rough qualitative scale, but it really does help in uh, determining how severe is the problem and how aggressive do we need to be with treatment. And so your, your score is like an overall score for all four categories. It's not like you're having, it's not like you would have a one under the mucus and a four under the, you know, opening. It's kind of like overall, this is the score. Is that right? Yes. We originally published something that was more complicated, like you said, that we, we were scaling every factor. <laughs> Nobody used it. Too complicated. <laughs> Too so much. this is a combined inflammatory <laughs> quality of opening rough number. Gotcha. And in looking at the eustachian tube, you also talk a lot about that kind of um, band of mucosal edema that is common in your um, obstructive patients. Um, can you talk more about that? So when you, when you look at the eustachian tube, there, there commonly is a little redundant band that runs along the floor in the cartilaginous wall. So that's quite normal. But in the it very early on can become edematous, and it will have this pale edema that can bulge into the lumen. If that becomes significant, that is the most common finding you'll see with the Barrow Challenge patients. Now, when you have more severe obstructive dysfunction, that band can just blend in with the rest of the edema. But that's why I pay attention to that band. It's the most common thing you'll see in the patients who are only Barrow Challenged. Mm -hmm. But again, the band is normal, but then you'll see that it's not protruding significantly into the lumen. It's not a problem. Gotcha. Yeah, I think the the patients who who are really swollen and you know you just barely see a little a little slit of the eustachian tube, and when they're when they swallow and when they yawn, you don't see a lot of opening. Those those are the more obvious ones, and then you've got the patients that are kind of you know in between. And then can you talk a little bit about patchless patients where you might see concavity or you might see that, you know, yellowing, like that yellowish defect where you're maybe seeing some of the fat underneath the mucosa. Right. Uh, before we leave uh, the Barrow Challenge, so when we were talking about the patients got a Barrow Challenge history, you look at the TM and the tympanogram, it's all normal uh, because they're not flying. It's that band of redundant mucosa that I'm looking for on the endoscopy to help clinch the diagnosis. Now, in contrast, a patchless eustachian tube, if they've actively got symptoms, you have to be able to, you will see a defect in the valve. There's going to be a chink in the valve somewhere. It's usually on the membranous wall, the membranous side. The more common defect is going to be typically right at the roof, the 12 o'clock position. They've got a defective lateral cartilaginous lamina. It usually has a little triangular point that sticks into the lumen and helps close the valve at the very top where the mucosa is very thin. And if that's deficient, then uh, that's a really common location for the defect. Less commonly, or, or in conjunction with that, you can have a, a, a concavity in the whole membranous wall. And that's where they're missing a lot of the fat, the osmond's fat that occupies much of the membranous wall. If, you, uh, if you've got mucosal, submucosal atrophy, then you'll see the yellow of the osmond's fat. The more severe cases, the fat's disappearing or gone, and you, you look at the membranous wall, and you're just seeing the, the naked tensor veli palatini muscle mm -hmm. with a little strip of fat separating that from the floor uh, where the levator veli palatini muscle. So you can see these two red muscles, the levator in the floor, the tensor in the membranous wall, a little strip of Osman's fat, this big concave defect in the membranous wall. So it's some kind of concavity. A tympanic membrane exam that is consistent with obstruction. So maybe you see 
you know, retraction or fluid and they can't lateralize with a modified Valsalva, kind of your classic patient history of tubes. And then you look in the back of the nose and it looks more patchless than it looks inflamed. Is the idea that maybe the the disease is just kind of in that deeper one third of the eustachian tube that you just can't see very well? It certainly could be. So in that patient, I would want to make sure that they're not doing the inappropriate nasal uh, uh, sniffing, that they don't, uh, they, there's no patchless history, no autophony, no sniffing to cause that. And um, yeah, typically these patients, uh, very commonly, they get middle ear fusion every time the tube comes out. Uh, so yes, I, uh, we do find that they have a, an obstruction higher in the valve than you can actually see. And those are the ones, it may be a scar band left over from uh, past infection, and they can even be obstructed in the bony eustachian tube. Now, uh, that's about maybe 10% of our obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction may be in that category. They may have a problem in the bony portion. Uh, so the way to diagnose that is at a time when they don't have an effusion, typically they've got a tube, that's the time to get a CT. And if you see soft tissue density in the bony eustachian tube, that's telling you that's where the problem is. And then you have to decide, well, how do we get to that? Gotcha. And so, um, okay, so you've done your physical exam. We talked a little bit about some of the tests. So, you know, I assume all patients are probably getting an audiogram, getting tympanograms. Um, you mentioned some of the special tympanometry that can be done. So with patchless, you can use the reflex decay mode. Are you or your audiologist having them do like ipsilateral nasal breathing during that test or just breathing normally? Uh, specifically for the patchless test, yes, they breathe normally. We, we have them do it with the mouth open because that's not going to be as stimulating to uh, reflecting any pressure changes into the ear. So that's our baseline. And then mouth closed and then uh, ipsilateral nasal breathing. And that's, if you find it on that, then that's definitely patchless if you can pick it up on that. And that should be more sensitive. Exactly. Yeah, you see, you see clear deflections, pressure changes, and the audiologist is watching to see that they are coincident with the nasal breathing. And you got, do you guys do eustachian tube dis, like dilatory dysfunction testing with your tympanometry as well? We don't. Uh, it's, it's too unreliable. It's not a physiological challenge. Typically, your eustachian tube is going to open when you swallow and yawn, not necessarily just because you had a sudden pressure change applied to your eardrum. And so this is the reason that those tests have not been predictive of eustachian, of, of real live eustachian tube function. So most of these tympanometers nowadays will be able to do that, but they are, all of the studies have shown them to be unreliable. The only other test which has been shown to be really reliable with a tympanometer is uh, the Bluestone nine-step test, where you serially pressurize or produce negative pressure against the tympanic membrane. You have the patient do series of swallows. So it's a little more laborious. Most places don't do it. But it actually is the one tympanometer test that has correlated with uh, some degree of uh, performance after tympanoplasty, for instance. Okay. Interesting. So that's good to know. So interpret those results with caution, because a lot of our audiologists had, have started kind of, you know, automatically doing the, that eustachian tube dysfunction test if they have a patient coming in with, you know, complaints of clogged stuffy ears. Um, and I, I agree with you. The results have been kind of all over the place. So, um, so that's, that's helpful to, to know. Any other objective types of testing that can be done that kind of helps seal your diagnosis? These, we've really covered the ones that are, are available uh, widespread in, in our country. In other uh, countries, particularly Europe, uh, they have a, a tubal manometer. And the experience with that is increasingly uh, showing that it, it does have some benefit. It, it, can, it can really help pin down the diagnosis with yet more data points. It's not by itself conclusively diagnostic. And that's one problem with the eustachian tube testing. There's no single test that will give you the answer. So it's uh, this whole process of the history, the physical, tympanogram, audiogram, and any other testing you do, it all gets put together to get a final impression. The tubal manometer is a complicated device. Uh, basically, think of a tympanometry probe in your ear, and it actually 
generates pressure as you swallow. It ramps up the pressure as you swallow in your nasopharynx. You've got a pressure probe in your nose, and it then looks at the change on your eardrum from the probe in your ear. Uh, the newer version can even work if you have a perforation in your tympanic membrane. You can see that a little pressure just eked through. So uh, stay tuned. Maybe we'll get one of those approved in the States. Not there yet. Sonotubometry can also be used. Uh, there are some of those. You can get them in the States, but almost nobody uses them. It's a, a microphone in the ear and a tone probe in the nose when you swallow or yawn. If your eustachian tube opens, you'll, you'll get a louder sound in that microphone in your ear. But it doesn't always open every time you swallow and yawn. So there's a lot of false uh, negatives on that one. And uh, so, uh, or well, false, false positive abnormal test results. So you have to put, so uh, you, you have to put all of this together to make a diagnosis. Bottom line, the things we've talked about are pretty solidly diagnostic, history, physical, tympanometry, audiogram, and the endoscopy. All right. So moving on to treatment then. So for your dilatory dysfunction patients, patients who are obstructed, what does your treatment algorithm look like? Um, medical, surgical, procedural, what, what kinds of things are you offering patients? Well, so we're certainly uh, looking for medical treatment first. So uh, any un underlying etiology, especially if they're smoking, really try hard to get them from, to stop. Uh, if they are serious about treating the condition. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of allergy testing. I send them out for that. Uh, I'm big on, if, if it comes back, it's all negative. We understand they, it doesn't mean they don't have allergies. We just haven't been able to nail it down. We will sometimes re uh, request intradermal testing to go with that one step further. So we're really, really big uh, for anybody who's over, who's six or older, and especially the adults, there's a, a very high prevalence of allergies in that population, and that may be etiologic. So it, we're, we're quite aggressive about that, rhinosinusitis, every, all these other things. We want to treat them, and the majority get better without surgery. We reserve the surgery for those failures. As far as um, topical steroids, it, it seems like distribution of topical nasal steroids to that, you know, getting all the way back into the nose seems like that would be difficult. Do you ever try any sort of other types of tricks to try to be able to get medications to the back of the nose so that they're treating that mucosa of the eustachian tube specifically? Yeah, that, that's a very significant issue you're bringing up. So the nasal steroid sprays are beneficial in allergic rhinitis. And so we, we do have a lot of patients taking those. But you're right, it, it's, it doesn't truly get all the way back to the... Uh, nasopharyngeal orifice of the eustachian tube. Occasionally, I've used one of those, um, I'm blanking on the name of it now, but the, the newer device where you're, uh, is it Optinose? The, the, uh, when you're blowing yes. your nose? Yeah, um, yeah Xhance is the brand name. Xhance kind of is it. You yeah. put, yeah, the one piece in your mouth, one piece in your nose, and you're kind of blowing the medication into the nose. Right, yeah. So, uh, and some folks who I thought it was really uh, good to, to go that extra step, uh, we have done that, and I think anecdotally the results have been better. Uh, but uh, as you know, that's a lot harder to get through insurance. Yeah, for sure. And how long of a trial do you want patients to try their medical therapy before you say, okay, it's time to move on and start thinking about other options? I I'm usually uh, giving them six weeks. As far as reflux, are you managing reflux as well if, they, if you think that that could be the contributor, or are you having them see? GI or do any other testing? I'll get them started on antacids uh, and or uh, PPIs, uh, but I certainly ask them to follow up with their primary or GI or their referring otolaryngologist. Mm -hmm. And what about devices like an, like an otovent or an ear popper? Like, are those helpful for them to be doing in the meantime, or is it helpful for them to practice a modified Valsalva three times a day per se? Like, are those types of things helpful for a patient that's got obstructive type symptoms? Yeah, we love those. The mechanical devices, there, there's good evidence that they do work. So the balloon uh, we use in the kids, and, and it really can make a difference. Uh, the adults don't like the balloon. Looks funny on an <laughs> airplane. Uh, so the, yeah, you stay here, ear poppers, uh, for the folks who just cannot do uh, coordinate a modified Valsalva. 
that is a go-to device that we frequently will, will recommend. They become much more uh, affordable. Mm -hmm. And are you having them do it just as needed when they have symptoms, or is it something where it could benefit from them doing it daily for a while? Yeah, it depends. If we are uh, contemplating surgery, like a balloon dilation, and they really want to try maximal conservative uh, efforts, then uh, I'll have them do it you know, three times a day or more if they want. Others, if they find that, hey, that works for me, I only need it on an airplane, you know, great. They take it along on the plane. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's very var variable depending on, on the patient. So you mentioned um, eustachian tube dilation. I would love to get into that. Recently, hearing you talk about eustachian tube dilation, you mentioned that patients may need a minute, a minute and a half, or two minutes of dilation, depending on the severity of their pathology. Um, can you talk about how you decide which patients go in which buckets for length of dilation? Very important point. The device is approved for dilation up to two minutes, but not everybody needs the whole whack. So that uh, grading scale that we talked about earlier, uh, if, if there are a grade three or four moderate or severe inflammatory disease, the valve is very significantly compromised, uh, I'm going to do the full two minutes. But if they have a lesser amount of disease that we see in the lumen, uh, they've only got that uh, barrow challenge, the, the uh, edematous band of mucosa on the floor, uh, a grade two or, or you know, low grade three, I don't want to overdo it. And you can make them patchless even permanently if you overdo it. Uh, the balloon can be very effective. So I'll, I'll uh, based on how much inflammation I'm seeing, I might turn it back to a one and a half minute or even one minute. If the person who's got just minimal inflammation, barrel challenge, just maybe one minute. I will also point out that it's FDA labeled for 18 and above. We do uh, in Children's Hospital, uh, I do children. We have uh, some protocols for it. And uh, I never go above 1.5 minute in pediatrics. They're very sensitive to the balloon, and we have had some uh, patchless folks. Thankfully, they've all gotten better, but uh, it really made me aware that we have to turn down the duration of dilation in pediatrics and also for lesser inflammatory disease. What age are you starting to consider it for your pediatric patients? Uh, they're usually patients who've had several tympanostomy tubes already, and they're you know going to go for three or eight or some, you know, Mm -hmm. it, it just hasn't helped. They keep needing more tubes. We get there. It's usually allergic. Try to get that under control, and we'll, you know, we can go for the balloon with those patients. In the pediatric group, almost all of them wind up having uh, a lot of adenoid up against the torus tubarius, and the torus itself is quite large and inflamed, contributing to the problem. So in the pediatric population, we frequently do a lateral adenoidectomy and trim some of the torus lymphoid hyperplasia off the medial side of the torus only, the balloons for the lumen. Uh, so we do a lot of those combinations in the pediatric population. Again, off-label using a balloon in that group. I've done as young as five, but that's unusual. And are you combining that with another set of tubes when you go do it, or you, would you just do, would just do that by itself and see how they do? If they have a full effusion, I will typically combine it with a uh, short-term submillimeter tympanostomy tube, just so we can drain the fluid and make sure that everything's going to be okay, even in the short run. They don't always do that in other countries. Maybe it's not necessary, but if I've got the kid under anesthesia or adult, if you've got a full effusion, I, I typically will pull it, put in an infant tube. Mm -hmm. It'll stay in a few weeks or maybe under six months. Yeah. And the hope is that that'll be the last tube and you know things will get better on the eustachian tube side. Exactly. Yeah. And, and your adult patients who would like to proceed with a eustachian tube dilation, does the fact that they have have occasional episodes of patchless-type symptoms, is that a contraindication to them getting a dilation? Or would you just say, maybe we need to shorten it to one minute? Okay. If they've had patchless symptoms, <laughs> red alert, uh, you don't want to convert them to permanently patchless. So that patient is almost automatically going to, well, it depends on how how often it's happened, how recent was it, does it happen every time they're exercising, etc. If they've had significant episodes of patchless, I'll do everything I can to avoid doing a balloon dilation at all. Now, if, they, uh, really, if it's really indicated, I will turn down the uh, dilation time, yes. 
minute and a half, minute. You don't want to overdo it because patients hate being patchless. Yeah, kind of create another another problem. If you dilate a patient for one minute and they don't have as much success as as you were hoping, do you ever consider, you know, doing a repeat and doing it a little bit longer the next time? So uh, we have to decide, uh, do we think it was a problem that it was an insufficient amount of time or does this patient have a problem higher up in the lumen, but perhaps in the bony eustachian tube, that a repeat dilation isn't going to help? So we have to sort that out. I would probably do exactly what we said earlier, make sure, you know, get a CT in that patient, make sure they don't have an obstruction in the bony eustachian tube. But if everything looks like, yeah, the patient was better temporarily, but then the symptoms came right back, then I know the balloon did something, and yeah, I could take them back and have to do it for longer. That's actually very unusual. I, I've probably done that a handful of times, if that. So uh, balloon's pretty effective, even at one minute. A more common scenario with a, with a one-minute balloon would be that the uh, they had a benefit for weeks or months, and then it slowly started to slip back, or they didn't keep their allergies under control or something. That's the more common scenario where I would consider, okay, let's get your medical condition back under control, and we can do this again, and maybe I will do it for a longer time. And do you find that patients are wanting to kind of abandon all medical therapy after they do a dilation in hopes that they are cured? And do they need to continue their medical therapies? Yeah, oh, they absolutely would love to just discontinue it. And we really have to emphasize very strongly that this is a medical condition. You've got to keep that under control. Uh, we're, we're all familiar with adenoid tissue growing back if your allergies are not adequately controlled, if they're smoking. This is adenoid-like tissue we're treating inside the lumen of the eustachian tube. It behaves the same way. If you don't keep the underlying problem under control, you could ultimately fail. But if you have a patient with what you think is irreversible disease, the balloon will get you over that hump, but they've got to do the medical control to keep it uh, under control. Yeah. Well, um, just rounding this out, um, I think we could probably talk about this for, forever, but I want to make sure um, that we just touch on treatments for patchless. So in your patchless patients, once you've decided, you know, solidified that diagnosis, what is your treatment algorithm for that set of patients? Um, you know, what, what does that look like? Well, again, it starts with looking for the etiology. Uh, if it's weight loss, we don't have them gain weight. That usually goes wherever else you don't want. <laughs> But uh, if there are other things that are treatable, if they're on diuretics, uh, they're on uh, particularly um, oral contraceptive with uh, spironolactone, other oral, oral contraceptives are okay, but that particular combination seems to be prone. Caffeine, dehydration, allergic disease. Uh, if they're over-medicating on, on uh, antihistamines and nasal sprays, we'll convert them to nasal rinses and nasal chrome. Uh, immunotherapy when possible. So trying to control all of these other factors, temporal mandibular disorders, muscle, uh, muscular uh, treatments, relaxation therapy, etc. So we try all those things. If those don't work, uh, we resort to topical drops, saline drops, hypertonic saline drops for something more irritating. Four teaspoons of salt in a cup of water will give you a nice hypertonic solution that's cheap. You have to ex instruct the patients how to do it. So you've got a lie supine, Hang your head 15 degrees, apply the drops, and turn 45 degrees toward the floor. So it's kind of like a not as severe a head hanging hall pike position. And the drops, when they touch the station tube, will give a, a twinge that radiates to the ear. If they don't get the twinge, they missed. So I, you have to carefully coach them in all of those things. Hypertonic, they can do as often as they like. If none of this works, my go to is the patchule end. Patchul end, you can get over the internet. It's ascorbic acid solution, it's vitamin C in a bottle. It really stings a lot of the people. Some people say it's uh, too, too powerful for them. But uh, if they do that, three drops, two to three times a day for two straight months to try to get a lasting benefit really can work in a lot of the patients. So that's, that, those are the uh, go-to things. If they've failed the hypertonic, or the patch will end with a rigid protocol like that. Those are the ones I'm considering surgery if we have to. And real quick, what's, what's your, you know, the most common surgical option for these patients? Yeah, the most common thing I do is to, that we don't have any commercial device. So off-label, inserting an angiocatheter that are filled with molten bone wax, let it harden, cut it to size, 
and put it up the full length of the eustachian tube. And if they're out of town, I even put a stitch to it. We had great results with that. I can't do that if they've got a dehiscent carotid artery. So you know, for those patients, we have to do cartilage implants. So I'm actually making an incision in the walls of the, car, of the uh, eustachian tube and packing cartilage uh, pieces into the side walls to bulk it up. I've done that once. It's very challenging. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I hope you have the instrument. that far in the nose. Yeah, we, we, had, we had them order the special kind of eustachian tube, uh, like needle driver, you know, instruments to get to the back of the nose. But that is, it is very challenging um, throwing stitches in that part of the nose. So the, putting in a, the, the shim is much, much preferred, much easier. Right. And you're talking about a shim. So we, we call it a shim. It's a plumber's shim to help try to plug the leak of the valve without intentionally plugging it completely. So we do call it a shim. Yeah. And there's no good way to kind of measure and know what size you would need ahead of time. Right. I mean, we're because you're, you're ideally you're trying to partially occlude it, occlude it enough, you know, to where it's maybe still functions a little bit is that it's not too tight. But, you know, in general, you're trying out, you know, either 14, 16 or 18 gauge um, angiocaths, right? Right. Almost everybody takes a 14 gauge. But uh, uh, so if it won't pass, then I immediately switch to a 16 and I've rarely used an 18. But uh, we have a fair n a number of patients who uh, uh, get overly blocked with a 14 ultimately, uh, probably about 40% need a tympanostomy tube at least once. And it's made me wonder, should I be doing more 18 gauges? Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, a lot of the folks who I see are, are coming from a distance, and I really want to make sh ensure the success. So, uh, but I, I think in the future, I, I might do some more of our local patients with an 18. It may well work. I'm curious if you've had experience with the 18s and how well it worked. I've had maybe, I can think of maybe one or two patients where I've had to go down to an 18 because I just couldn't, the, the other ones just wouldn't pass. And, and one patient that was fine with. The, the other patient that I'm thinking of, we ended up going back and putting in a 16 because the 18 was too small. But very, very small cohort, challenging patient group. Well, congratulations on taking on these, uh, <laughs> the, these procedures. Uh, we, we need uh, a, lot, a lot more folks doing this. Well, I th thank you for, for being a resource because um, it's, it is very challenging and I, you've been a, a great help in kind of figuring out how to take care of this group of patients. So thank you to you. And I think we um, have to kind of put a pin in it here. Maybe we'll have to bring you back to kind of get into some more of the, you know, uh, ins and outs of treatments maybe in the future. But it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you today. So thank you so much for stopping by the podcast. Any final words or anything that you would want to leave with our listeners that we forgot to touch on? Well, I, I think we've done a really good comprehensive discussion of, of uh, the diagnosis and, and treatments, uh, certainly medical treatment, which is really key. These are common problems. So I, I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to participate with this. I, I'm honored by it. And I, and I just want to say thanks to all of the many, many people who have contributed to all of this work. This has been uh, the result of a lot of people's efforts over many years. So uh, I, I'm very happy to try and distill it down and try to bring it home. Awesome. Well, th well, thank you for being here today. Thank you to our listeners for stopping by the show. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share, uh, and uh, leave us your comments and feedback. We, we love to hear from you. Follow us on social media. We are on Instagram and Twitter at underscore backtable ENT. That's a wrap. Thank you. 